Hello and welcome to lecture 9 of Bioinformatics for Schoolers course. In this lecture, we will be discussing about proteins, their sequence, their structure and their function. We already know that the sequence of a protein is made up of many many amino acids. They are basically chains of amino acids with an N terminal and a C terminal end. These amino acids are linked together by some type of bonds known as peptide bonds and therefore the chain is also known as a polypeptide chain. Now, According to central dogma, the sequence of the protein or the sequence of amino acids in a protein is already determined by DNA. The gene present on the DNA is transcribed to form an mRNA which is further translated to form a protein. A protein once forms holds itself to become fully functional. Now, each protein have a unique shape and most of the proteins are made up of about 50 to 2000 amino acids. The longest protein known is titan which is present in human muscle and acts like a spring. It is made up of at least 27,000 amino acids. Now, these are the examples of protein structures. So, you know hemoglobin that helps in carrying oxygen throughout the uh, blood, uh, throughout the body and insulin that maintains blood glucose levels and rubisco that fixes atmospheric carbon dioxide into sugar molecules and it is specifically present in plants. This is how these proteins fold themselves to perform their respective functions adequately. Now, the core of the protein structure lies in its sequence. We already know that a combination of three bases in the RNA corresponds to one amino acid in a protein and there are a total of 20 amino acids. Now, while translation, ribosome and tRNA keeps adding these uh, amino acids in a polypeptide chain after reading the uh, codon on the mRNA. Wherever the stop codon is there, which is UGA in this case, the protein synthesis stops. So, this is an example of hemoglobin where the sequence of the protein is shown and the corresponding structure is shown. Let's try to understand how sequence leads to structure like this. So, in proteins, there are four different levels of structures. It's like if you want to read something, you should just be aware of the basic letters in the language. That is the first level. And then you should know how to make words from combinations of these letters. This is level two. Further, then you would go on to uh, make the combination of these words to form sentences and then a paragraph. These are your levels 3 and 4. Similarly, for proteins, the simple straight sequence of amino acid constitutes the level 1. And uh, it is also known as primary structure. Next, how these sequences start folding locally, that means at small small stretches, constitutes the level 2 or secondary structure. The complete folding of a protein in 3D space is called as a tertiary structure and it is a structure which is, which is important for performing the function of a protein and for its interactions with other proteins. Now, some of the proteins are made up of more than one polypeptide chain. Each chain is known as a subunit. The folding of these subunits with respect to each other to make a single protein forms the fourth level of the protein structure and it is known as a quaternary structure. In this example here, you can see blue and brown chains. These two are the two subunits of the protein and together they are making the quaternary structure. Let's see each of these four structures in more detail. This is showing the primary structure of proteins which is a sequence of amino acids linked together to form a polypeptide chain. This is just like a simple straight chain. Now, the secondary structure of proteins constitutes the stretches of polypeptide that either form alpha helices or form beta sheets. Interestingly, the overall 3D folding pattern of each protein is unique. But there are two folding patterns that are commonly found within them. Uh, here, the alpha helix is shown as a helical ribbon, whereas the beta sheet is shown as, as a set of arrows. 
First of all, the alpha helix was discovered in keratin protein. Keratin is a protein that make your hair, skin and nails. In keratin, the two alpha helices wrap around each other to form a stable structure and this structure is known as a coiled coil. The third uh, one, the third figure here that you are uh, looking at is the actual structure of the coiled coil. Generally, the alpha helices are present in proteins that fit inside the cell membrane. Now, the beta sheet was discovered by studying silk protein. Beta sheets are present in the core of the pro many proteins and can be made by polypeptide chain either by making parallel segments or by making anti-parallel segments as can be seen by the arrows here. It is basically a zigzag pattern that forms the protein very rigid. These are the examples of protein structure made by alpha helices and beta sheets. If you look closely, you would be able to appreciate that a protein can either only have alpha helix or a protein can also have only beta sheets as can be seen by the arrow. However, there are many proteins that exist which have both alpha helices as well as beta sheets. Having understood the commonly present secondary structures, let's talk about amino acids once more. We know that there are 20 different types of amino acid and these amino acids can be divided into two categories, the polar ones and the non-polar ones. Now, the polar ones are those that love water. That means they can easily interact and make bonds with water. On the other hand, the non-polar amino acids, uh, they are water-hating amino acids, meaning that they cannot bond or interact with water. In each category, we have 10 amino acids. Now, based on the type of amino acid present in the sequence of protein, the structure is formed. We know that the proteins are present in the cells and that the cell contain a lot of water inside them. So, the protein folds itself in such a manner that the polar amino acids that can bond with water, they remain outside of the surface and the non-polar amino acids which hate water, they go deep and gets buried inside the structure of the protein. In, in this manner, uh, a stable tertiary structure of a protein is formed. For understanding the quaternary structure of proteins, let's look at the hemoglobin molecule. Hemoglobin is a large protein molecule containing four polypeptide chains. Each of these chains are known as a subunit. There are two alpha subunits and two beta subunits. These subunits are made by different genes and then the protein products of this gene come together to form a single protein molecule. As you can see here that the chains is represented by different color and there are four different colors here. So the overall primary structure folds itself to form the secondary structure and tertiary structure. It depends on the sequence of amino acid that how a structure will be formed. And the quaternary structure will be formed when there are more than one subunits in a protein. We have learned about the structures of the protein. These structures can be represented by many different ways depending on which features we want to look at. In the first case here, uh, the backbone of the polypeptide is only visible and that's why it's called polypeptide backbone model. In the second case, alpha helix and beta sheets are visible and it is commonly called as the ribbon model of protein. In the third case, the wire model, each of the lines represent the bonds between the amino acids. It's like a skeleton structure. In the space filling model, each of the atom in the protein, uh, such as the C and N, are shown as spheres. It is one of the best ways to describe the 3D structure of a protein. After discussing so much about proteins, let's talk a little bit about food. We know that there are different kinds of toppings available for a pizza. 
you can have these toppings alone as vegetables such as you can have tomato mushroom or cucumber and you will get the unique taste of that particular vegetable but if you put these toppings on a pizza then the overall pizza would have more flavors and taste also you can combine your favorite toppings according to your wish and you can make your own favorite pizza similar to the toppings on pizza we have something called as domains in proteins so the domains are distinct functional or structural units in a protein they can fold independently of the rest of the protein into a compact stable structure and they are responsible for a particular function or interaction in a in the protein but they contribute to overall role of a protein just like the toppings on your pizza now there is an example of a domain known as sh3 its role is to enable the protein protein interaction then there is a protein known as nck which contains three of such domains and one different domain name as hs uh, sh2 all these are important for nck protein uh, to function as an adapter molecule so the adapter proteins help in positioning other molecules to maintain proper signaling it's like your electrical adapters that you carry while traveling where you can plug your mobile phone laptops earphones all at once for charging now it is an example of how a particular domain is present across different proteins for example the brown color domain here is shared in protein b c d and e whereas the green domain is common in protein b uh, in protein a c and d all of these proteins have unique functions to play but still they can uh, have the shared domains on the basis of shape the proteins are of two types globular proteins and the fibrous proteins as the name indicates globular proteins have the compact structure like a ball and therefore they are round or spherical in nature mostly these proteins have functional roles to play also they are water soluble on the other hand the fibrous proteins are simple having elongated 3d structures that means they are long and narrow most of the times they have structural roles to play which spans large distances within the cell and they are insoluble in water examples of globular proteins are insulin and ova albumin so insulin helps in maintaining blood sugar and ova albumin is a protein that is found in egg as you can see both of them have compact structure with irregular surfaces by now you would appreciate that these are the space filling models of the protein now examples of fibrous proteins include collagen and keratin collagen is present in muscle bones and skin it forms the connective tissue and gives strength to our body it's a triple helical structure and many such molecules join to form the collagen fiber that is strong enough to support our body keratin as you would remember is present in our hair skin and nails these are coiled coil uh, molecules made up of two alpha helices interestingly the waviness or the straightness of your hair depends on the bonding of keratin protein when you straighten your hair uh, the bonds break a little bit and when you curl more bonds are formed when you make your hair to curl the way you want you are essentially breaking some bonds and making some new bonds overall the proteins play a lot of functions such as they can be enzymes transporters scaffolds or antibodies as enzymes they can break bonds in a substrate to form the desired product the best example is the enzymes used in the digestion process they can break the food that we eat some of them can break sugars or others can break fats or even proteins as transporters they allow the movement of certain molecules inside the cell 
they are placed on the cell membrane and act as guards and choose which molecule can enter the cell they can open themselves to allow the entry of molecule and once they are inside the cell they can close themselves as scaffolds they bring different proteins together these proteins have to work together but they are scattered inside the cell the scaffold proteins sticks to them and allow them to be closer and do the function antibodies are also protein molecules they determine our immunity by fighting with the infection that our body encounters this is an example of how different proteins can interact together to perform a set of functions it is a protein network in a yeast cell you can imagine how complex it would be in cases in case of humans where even for small small functions that we do in our daily lives a lot of proteins are involved even by eating so many proteins have to work together such as the proteins in muscles the enzymatic proteins signaling proteins and others and they all all of these have to get involved to facilitate the process of consuming and digesting food the situation is similar whatever uh, other functions we do till now i hope i have convinced you enough that protein sequence determines protein structure and function So there are a total of two hundred and thirty million proteins that exist in the protein database, but the three D structures are known only for about point two million of them. That means there is a huge gap in the understanding of protein structure and function. Predicting protein structure remains one of the biggest challenges in biology, but the question is that why does it even matter? what would we gain even if we know the structure of all the existent 200 million proteins simplest answer is improvement in health and disease conditions for example the structure of hemoglobin once became known has uh, deepened the understanding of the blood disorders such as sickle cell anemia similarly The structure of spike protein of SARS-CoV-2 virus has played a vital role in designing effective vaccines against the virus. Also, the structure of Rubisco has contributed immensely in deepening our understanding of photosynthesis in the plants. There are different ways by which the protein structures can be predicted. First is the experimental method. there are number of techniques that can be used for example the x-ray crystallography and nuclear magnetic resonance as shown here for x-ray crystallography the protein has to be made into a crystal form and then x-rays are used to pass through the spaces of the crystal in the process the rays bend and form some kinds of pattern that are known as diffraction pattern this is then used to create a protein model in case of nmr the molecule structure is studied by exploiting the magnetic field around the atomic nuclei of the molecule in it is a little complex technique the protein is used in solution and it is taken and by applying magnetic field the spectra are recorded the spectra are processed and the protein structure is finally deduced by the experts apart from experimental methods there are computational methods that can predict protein structures from the sequence the first method is homology modeling let's assume we have the amino acid sequence of a protein now to find its structure we will first match the sequence of our protein of interest that we want to solve with all the sequences of the proteins that are already solved by the experimental methods once the sequence similarity is found with any protein we can guess that the structure will also be similar to that protein therefore we can predict the structure of our protein of interest second is de novo method in which we match the protein of interest sequence with all the sequences from different species 
and try to guess how well it will fold where alpha fold with uh, where alpha helices will lie where beta sheets will lie then like that we can generate many possibilities in which our protein of interest can fold each of these possibilities are given a score based on their stability and where the energy requirement for folding is less the structure that is most stable is said to be the predicted structure for the protein of interest next is the alpha fold alpha fold tool has come recently it uses ai based techniques to predict the structure of any protein the tool has been trained on previously known 100000 a uh, protein structures and now it uses that information to predict the structure for any new protein that you give to it summarizing this talk we have learnt about types of amino acids levels of protein structure representation of protein structures domains types of proteins functions of proteins and methods to know protein structures now We know that protein is not just a sequence but a blueprint on which its structure is made and thus the functionality is determined. In the end I would like to tell that the images and concepts explained in this lecture have been adapted from Bruce Albert's uh, Molecular Biology of the Cell book, Leninger Principles of Biochemistry book, Google, BioNinja, PDB and Uniprot. Thank you for paying the attention.